Welcome to this time of worship family and to our guests and visitors. We used to have a dog named Shakespeare. It was the name given to him at the Humane Society when we picked him up. And he was an excellent guard dog. Uh, everybody that came into our cul-de-sac was viewed as an arch enemy. And Shakespeare just let me know that they were not welcome. Except when they got in the house, he licked whoever it was to death. Uh, our present dog, uh, little Bailey, is not exactly a, uh, a guard dog. But a dog is a good thing to have in your house as a watchdog. For example, the boys at the prison tell me, um, not every week, but the boys tell me that when they plan on breaking into a house, there's certain things that convince them that this is not a good place to rob. Uh, one is a locked door. And secondly, if they hear the sound of a dog, they say, I don't want to go there. So just in case you're worried about your house being broken into, you may want to visit the Humane Society when we're done here. Dogs keep enemies and thieves at bay. The Bible tells us that giving thanks keeps some thieves at bay. Psalm 92 verse 1 says, Not give thanks to the Lord, but it is told to give thanks to the Lord. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. That is, it's not simply good intrinsically to give thanks. It's a benefit for me. And it's a benefit for you to give thanks. Why? Why is it that giving thanks as a habit and that's what we're doing here. We're praising God for giving Him thanks. Why is it that giving thanks is good for us? Because it keeps the thieves of entitlement, of whining, of complaining, and thinking, I deserve better in life. I deserve a better family. I deserve a better job. I deserve a better car. I deserve a better insurance company. I deserve better. That sort of an entitlement whining, complaining spirit is kept at bay when I look at what God has given me and I give thanks. When I give thanks. The Old Testament calls on God's people to give thanks. And Paul does the same. Listen to his words and we'll begin or re-begin our worship. Colossians 2 So then, just as you've received Christ as Lord, Live in Him, rooted and built up in Him. Listen to the tree language there. Strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and be overflowing with thankfulness. Are you grateful today? Then express it. Open your mouth and give thanks to God. Pray with me. Forgive us, Lord, for approaching you with a whining, critical, complaining, entitled spirit that we deserve more. We don't. What we have, we don't deserve. But it's given to us on the basis of your overflowing grace and your mercy. And we wish, Lord, to reflect that in our praise and in our thanksgiving. I'm praying that our children will look at their moms and dads and their uncles and aunts and their neighbors and their friends and say, my family is a grateful family. My family gives thanks. Let it happen this morning. If we're in some way chained by ingratitude, by entitlement, release the chains. Let us open our mouths, lift our hands, and let the gratitude of our heart overflow in song and in word. We pray for the glory of Christ, in whose name we pray. And everyone shout it out, man. Amen. Where is Christ born for? He was paying attention. Yeah. I think it's time for you to yes. move uh, after prayer right into teaching. Uh, we're doing a series in Luke's Gospel, going through paragraph by paragraph. That's how the Bible is written. It's written paragraph by paragraph. Each paragraph is a unit of thought, one main idea. And Luke is a genius at stringing paragraphs together like a big jigsaw puzzle. Everyone, every piece, every section, every paragraph is connected to the next one, connected to the next one, and to the next one. Most of us have been taught that 
when we come to the book of Psalms, there's an exception to that rule. Most of us have grown up thinking that the Psalms are a isolated uh, jumble of unconnected Psalms one to the other. So your favorite Psalm might be Psalm 67 or 113 or 149, and you kind of camp on that Psalm and maybe you've memorized it, maybe you enjoy repeating it. But this is not true. Uh, the Psalms are a chain, beginning with the first Psalm all the way to Psalm 150. It's a chain of a theme, and the theme is the psalmists or the psalm writers are looking forward to a future king who is both priest and prophet and a ruler, a king, and he will come from Israel's house, and one day he will rule and rule victorious. And based on that hope, we are called to praise him. This morning, as we look at Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 20, verses 41 to 44, Jesus quotes a psalm, one verse from it. He's, he quotes from Psalm 110, verse 1. And it is the most quoted Old Testament passage in all of the New Testament. So if you look at Psalm 110, that psalm is quoted more by all the New Testament writers than any other Old Testament passage. We must remember that Jesus himself, after he was resurrected from the dead, Luke 24, 44, said, These are the things I told you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law, prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And Jesus will quote Psalm 110, verse 1, today, about himself. But, and this is the point, the Psalm, Psalm 110 is in a collection of Psalms that has a theme. And I'm going to show you now if the folks in the back can help visualize this better in the form of a chart. Psalm 110 is the hinge of a series of songs. It's the centerpiece. It's like the hinge on a door. And the first section of this sequence of psalms, if you will follow on the screen behind me and listen to what I'm saying at the same time, Psalm 107 to 108, we have a record of God's redeeming his people all through history. People are in trouble and God redeems them. The next two psalms, Psalm 108 and Psalm 109, we have pleas, requests for redemption. Please redeem us. I'm in a bad spot. Please, help, help. And there's no answer. There's no answer in Psalm 108, and there's no answer in Psalm 109. This is why some psalms never get chosen as the favorite psalms, because there's no answer to them. But that's intentional, because the psalms were never meant to be read by themselves, unlike how we were taught to read the psalms. But how we were taught is bad news. The psalms are chained. And after Psalm 108 and 109 is the answer to the pleas for redemption. And the key is the psalm that Jesus quotes. Here, in Psalm 110, <clears throat> we have a picture of David's Lord at his right hand. He's a king. He has an army. He's also a priest in the order of Melchizedek, not Aaron. And he's a victorious warrior over the enemies of God. How ironic that the final two psalms in this section, Psalm 1. Final three psalms, I stand corrected, Psalm 111, Psalm 12, and 113, instead of pleas for redemption, what do we have? We have praise for redemption. You see that? So we have, please redeem us. Answer, this Lord, this priest, this concrete king, who Jesus applies to himself. And then what do we have in response? Praise. Thank you, Lord, for redeeming us. You see how that works? Now, the whole psalm is built like that. The whole psalter is that way. 
So I'll be talking a little bit more about this today. But as you read the Psalms, visit the neighbors. <laughs> visit the Psalm before it. Visit the Psalm after it. And notice all the links that connect these Psalms. They're everywhere. There's hundreds and hundreds of links between the Psalms. And a good, careful observation of the text spot them, and it'll be a great encouragement. And then some of you may choose one of these psalms to be your favorite because you have the problem and then you have the solution. You have the question over here and then you have the answer. That's how the psalms work. I've told you many times before, I'll say it one more time, Psalm 23, everybody's favorite psalm, is in a series of psalms. It begins with verse 20, 21, a king who asks God to save him. Psalm 22, that same king is rejected and killed. Psalm 23, that same king is now in paradise, resurrected. And in Psalm 24, he ascends up to heaven. Who does that look like? <laughs> who does that look like? A king who's killed, resurrected, and ascends to heaven. Any ideas of who that might be? This is why Jesus said, everything written about me and the law of the prophets and the Psalms must be what? Fulfilled. And he, of course, is fulfilled. Why don't we uh, have a look at Psalm 110. Let's stand as I read it. I won't expound on it. But since Jesus is going to quote this one, quote from verse 1, Perhaps it would be good for us to hear it. The word of, of the Lord. Psalm 110. A psalm of David. This is the declaration of Yahweh. To my Adonai. The English Bible says, This is the declaration of the Lord who said to my Lord. That's in English. But Hebrew, here is the word of Yahweh spoken to Adonai. What's Yahweh and Adonai? What's Yahweh and Adonai? Those are two names for who? For the God of the Old Testament. So we have God speaking to God. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So Adonai is being spoken to by Yahweh and Adonai has enemies. Right? He's got enemies. And Elohim, God, Yahweh, says to Adonai, sit. Well, the right hand. So, if I were you, it would be over here. And the right hand is a place of what? A victory. It's a place of honor. After you win a victory, sit at my right hand. So apparently there's a time when he didn't sit there. Sit at my right hand until I make what? Your enemies. A footstool for him your feet. The Lord will extend your, who's your? Adonai. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. What's a scepter? Do you have one of those in your back seat? Or in the trunk of your car? Can you get them at Walmart? What's a scepter? It's the symbol of what? Royalty. A king. So this person, Adonai, is a king. And God says, I'm going to extend your rule from Zion. Which means what? Not only will you be king of Israel, you're going to be what? King of the world. <clears throat> rule over your surrounding enemies. Your people will volunteer on, on your day of battle. In holy splendor from the womb of the dawn, the dew of your youth belongs to you. The Lord has sworn an oath. That's Yahweh. Has sworn an oath. That's the same person speaking in verse 1. The, you, the Lord has sworn an oath and will not take it back. You, you're a king. You are a priest forever, but not in Aaron's tribe, because they all lived and died. But you are a priest in the order of Melech Sadiq, the king of righteousness. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his anger. He will judge the nations, heaping up corpses. He will crush leaders over the entire world. He will drink from the brook by the road. Therefore, he will lift up his head. 
lot to go into, and I promised I wouldn't expound this psalm, but I started to, so I'm quickly moving away from that temptation. But this is the psalm that is most quoted in the New Testament by all the writers, and they all point to who? Jesus. Thanks for listening. Let's be seated. Pray with me. There's one thing we don't want to do, Father, this morning, and that's to miss the message of Scripture. And the message is all about Jesus. It's about Christ, who's a king, who's a prophet, and who's a priest. Foreshadowed in the old and realized in the new. And we live now on the other side of the cross and the empty tomb and the ascension to heaven. But sometimes it's not easy to get it. People come in here this morning, they may have issues on their mind. They may be thinking about their kids or a mortgage or the car that broke down last week or the bill that's unpaid or they may have an ache in their leg or in their brain. A lot of things can distract us. I'm praying that you would clarify and clear up our thoughts and soothe our emotions if we're hit by grief or if we're excited about some game yesterday. Let us focus in with intentionality on the words of Jesus as he speaks about himself. Speak to us and arm parents with tools they need for the conversations they have this Christmas season with their kids. For your glory we ask in Christ's name. <clears throat> when I was uh, in grade six, I began to sell to make money to win prizes, seeds, seed packets or packets of seeds to all my neighbors. Because if I sold a certain amount of packets of seeds, always to the wives and the mothers in the neighborhood, men never wanted to buy seeds because none of them seemed to have a great thumb. But I would win prizes. I got a set of binoculars one time for selling a certain amount of seeds. Another prize I got was this knife. I've kept it since 1966. And I began carrying this knife. It had a sheath to it. And I've since lost it in all the moves we've made. But I lost the sheet. But this knife was a real uh, treasure of mine. It has a bone handle. And you could scale fish. Of course, never was a fisherman. It had a pop bottle opener right there. And I could carve things. But I found after a while it was just too big. And people look at you funny when you walk into school and you have this knife on your, you know, and no one else does it. And so I decided I need something a little bit less conspicuous when I was in junior high. And um, I didn't want to be looked like, at, like a thug, so uh, I looked for another knife, and so I began carrying around another knife. And this is a bit smaller. This is compact. It would fold up and uh, fit nicely into your pocket. And as I began to get older, uh, I began to realize I like to fix things. And sometimes this was just not good enough to fix things. Uh, this can do certain things. I can use this as a flat blade screwdriver, but you can see the knife edge is not real good for a screwdriver. So I thought I need something for all these incidents in my day where I can fix things that are broken with other people or with me or my car or what have you. So I got what was called a multi-tool. And this is what I carry uh, every day of my life on my belt. I have a little pouch here on the side. And this thing opens up, you have pliers, but you all also have a knife, and then you've got a serrated knife, and you've got Phillips head screwdriver, you've got flat blade screwdriver, and then if I want to do my nails, there's even a, a file, if I can get it out, for my nails. Here it is, yes. And here's my nails. If I had any nails, I might be able to file them. There's other things to this multi-tool. 
So everywhere I go, I've got a tool on me that can help tighten things up if I need it. This Christmas, uh, your kids, your little ones, sooner or later, either while you're trimming the tree, reading the story, a Bible story about Christmas, or singing Christmas carol songs, your kids are going to say to you one day, Mommy, Daddy, how can baby Jesus be God? I mean, Jesus is big God. How can he be a baby? How can a little baby, baby be a big God? That's a fair question. Do you have a tool for that question? Um, Do you have a toolkit and a toolbox? For all those questions that your kids ask, you want to have a tool, don't you? Don't you want to be prepared and answer those questions? Sure you do. Every parent wants. But most of us don't have the tools to answer that question. How can Jesus be God? That's a huge question. And they deserve a good answer from scriptures. So uh, I'm going to suggest that uh, for your children, you do what I did many, many years ago. I bought this when I was in college, and I use it as my journal. And I write things down in it, and prayer requests, and I keep track of all of the stuff I work on my cars, things in the house. I've had this for, well, many, 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 many years. You can see it, it's held together by uh, very expensive duct tape here. And I keep track of things that my sons need as, as children and the issues that are going on in their lives, the issues that need to be addressed by Scripture one at a time. And so it's a journal of family, it's a journey of things that need fixing, etc., etc., etc. So this morning we are going to encounter a passage in Luke's Gospel that I think is a tool that parents can put in their toolbox, even grandparents can put in your toolbox, or if you work with kids, period, and the kids you work with are not your own, which is, which is a, a wonderful thing, a tool to put in your box when they ask this question. How can Jesus... Baby Jesus in the manger be God. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to our series in Luke, Luke chapter 20, verse 41 to 44. I encourage you to go there if you haven't already. And uh, this conversation is, Jesus has this conversation with the scribes, and he basically asks two questions, both beginning with the word how. How in verse 41 and verse 44, how? And he doesn't give an answer. It's a thought provoker. And notice Jesus' teaching method. What's his method here? What's his method of, of teaching? It's asking questions. And it's asking questions from the scripture. And it forces them not to fill in the blank. Jesus is not a fill in the blank kind of a teacher. It's a one that forces them what? To put two and two together. To teach your men, your boys, your girls, your daughters, your sons, to learn to think theologically. The subject that he's going to address is an extended conversation about resurrection. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the Sadducees, the more liberal religious political party of the day, who thought they had Jesus tied up in knots with this question about a woman who married seven men and all seven died, then whose wife will whose whose wife will she be in heaven? And Jesus demolishes their argument and says, You guys don't know what you're talking about. There is no marriage in heaven because there's no death in heaven. We don't need marriage and we don't need kids in heaven because there's no death. You guys don't know what you're talking about. And then he goes to Exodus 3 and he says, God is the God of the living, not of the dead. He's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Those three guys are very much alive. They're buried, yes, their bodies are dead. But they themselves are very, very much alive. He is the God of the living. Now in 41 and 44, he wants to push the issue of resurrection a little bit further from simply saying there is a resurrection, there is an afterlife. But now he's going to take one step, and it's this. He's going to say, I be raised from the dead. So he's pushing the envelope of their ability to understand. So let's have a look. Verse 41. He said to them, who's them? 
Now, the previous verse said that at the end of this conversation about resurrection, the scholars of the day, these are the lawyers who have an expertise in the Bible. Specifically, they're experts in the Torah, the Pentateuch, the Genesis through to the run. They're the experts. And these guys say to Jesus, man, that was a good answer. Well done, because no one else dared to ask him any more questions. So Jesus has been on the defensive and answering questions. But now he goes on the offense. You know, in football, there's a defensive team, and then there's an offensive team. Well, Jesus is now going on offense. He's going to take the ball, and he's going to throw it to his receivers, us, and he's going to make yardage. So he said to them, these Mosaic lawyers, they're called scribes, and he says, how do they say that the Christ, that's the Greek word for Messiah, in Hebrew it's Mashiach, and in Greek it's Christos, same thing. How do they say that the Christ, the Messiah, is the son of David? For, here's the reason it's complicated, and confusing and somewhat contradictory verse 4 for David himself said in the scroll of the Psalms or the book of the Psalms David himself said the Lord that's Yahweh said to my Lord that's Adonai Yahweh said to my Lord David's Lord David's Lord Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Do you see the problem that Jesus is bringing up here? Jesus is connecting the Christ, the Messiah, with the one who received the word from God, sit at my right hand, called He's called Adonai, my Lord. David said, David, living a thousand years earlier than Jesus, David said in the Psalms, repeating a, a conversation in heaven, God, Yahweh, said to Adonai, sit at my right hand, and Adonai is David's Lord. How can he be David's Lord and his son? Now, clarification, I think, I think you all know this. That Jesus was born in the house of David, the lineage of David. Jesus is not literally the son of David. David lived a thousand years earlier. But Jesus was born, not only in Bethlehem, but born to Joseph, who comes from the tribe of Jesse, or of David, in the tribe of Judah. So, if Jesus is human and he's a son of David, how could he be David's Lord? Divine. How could he be human and divine? And David, when he says this, the Lord said to my Lord, Yahweh said to Adonai, sit at my right hand, David is speaking as if that Messiah existed then. <laughs> He existed way back then. How did, how did he do that? He wasn't born yet. The Messiah wasn't born yet in Bethlehem. And yet that conversation is a thousand years earlier. And David says, yeah, he exists. He, they had this conversation. Under inspiration, David says, there is a Messiah. He exists. And David's day. How do you put those together? Now, who's he speaking to? The experts in the law. The guys who should know all the answers. And by the silence we have, by the silence in this passage, they haven't put those things together. They haven't put together the fact that when Messiah existed in David's day, there was this conversation in heaven between God and Adonai, someone who is equal to God, there's this conversation, and yet later on in time, Jesus becomes a human being. It's like, huh? Why is this a problem?
because in Jewish theology, the Messiah is human. He comes from the seed of David. But how can he be human and divine? This is a passage that you can take your kids to and say, how can baby Jesus, little baby Jesus, be big God? This is a passage that's not easy to understand. I'll grant you that, uh, partly because of how our English uh, translations render it. The Lord said to my Lord, that's kind of confusing. But it still presents the problem. It presents somewhere of a contradiction. How can the Messiah, the Christ, be the son of David? Or as the outline suggests it, how can David's son, a human, be David's Lord at the same time? Which one of you who has a son, which one of you dads out there who has a son, calls your son Lord? Anybody? Anybody out there have a son and you call him Lord and you bow down to him? No. What's it supposed to be? The son is under the authority of dad, right? But here it's reversed. <laughs> David's son is David's boss. David's son is David's lord. That's a problem. That's a contradiction. He goes on in um, verse 44, and he reverses it. Notice what he says in verse 44. Therefore, David calls him lord, Calls who Lord? Calls the Messiah Lord. Adonai, Lord. David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? You get it? At least you see the contradiction. How can David's Lord be his son? And how can David's son be his Lord? Jesus has asked the question twice. He's just the first. Why did he just come out and say, Hey folks, I'm equal to the Father, and I'm fully human. Take that. If you don't like it, tough. Why don't you just come out and say it? This is what the critics do. The critics look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and say, you know, Jesus never came out and said, hey guys, I'm God. I'm divine. He never does that. Would he convince anybody if he used that tactic? Would he convince you? No. So what does Jesus do? to make the argument that he is divine and human. What does he do? He takes them to where? He takes them to their Bible. <laughs> he takes them to their Bible and he shows a problem. Something that they need to think through. I think that moms and dads, or anybody who works with people, you're going to get bombarded with questions all your life. And the question is, Will you have a tool for the moment? You can. And Jesus was ready because he knew the scriptures backwards and forwards. And that's why no one dared ask him any more questions. Wouldn't that be a great position to be in? No one dares to ask you a question because you know the Bible too well. It's not too bad of a place to be in. When your kids leave, they go out, they graduate from high school, and they go off to college, they're going to hear the critics. Will they be able to understand? Will they be able to have a good answer that makes sense and that's sourced in Scripture? Let me summarize what I think is going on here. Jesus has been talking about resurrection. He brings himself into the picture by showing that he's human and divine. This conversation that God has with God, with Yahweh has with Adonai, my Lord, with your Lord, my Lord, saying, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies that will stood you for your feet. We all know in this Gospel of Luke that Jesus has enemies, and they are the religious establishment. They are Jesus' enemies, and they will kill him. They will put him to death. He'll be buried. He'll be raised from the dead. He'll ascend to heaven. And what will God do for him at his ascension? He will sit where? He will sit at God's right hand. What does that imply? Resurrection of Jesus, right? We are now, right now, 
in that period where he says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. We're that in, we're the in the until age right now. We're in that period right now. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And God, sovereignly ruling over the nations, is gradually bringing the enemies of Jesus under his feet. We're in that period right now. And he's doing it with Jesus at the right hand of the Father, which is where he sat after he had done his work as a high priest, purging our sins like the song we sang. So, a couple of things come to my mind that I hope will be a benefit to us. I hope by way of takeaway, this might spark your thoughts and give you hope. Three suggestions. First suggestion is that when we look through the lens of Jesus as king, sitting at God's right hand, in power and in glory. That yes, the world may be against us. And yes, um, things may not be going right around the world or in this country. But nevertheless, we have no cause for concern. Because Jesus is seated. He's finished his work. And God is, um, God is about bringing his enemies to defeat. And it does not depend on who's in the White House. It does not depend on who wins the election. It does not depend who has more representatives in the House of Representatives or more senators. The victory of God does not depend on politics. Our hope is not in Congress or in the White House or in the Supreme Court. Our hope is in God. Our hope is in the sovereignty of God. That's where our confidence comes. That's where our hope is. And that's what we look to. All things may be going to hell. But Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father and God is bringing his enemies to defeat. That's what we can trust. That's, what, that's why we can get up every morning not anxious, not scared, not worried because our high priest sits at God's right hand. See your tomorrow through those lens. See your tomorrow through those glasses. One day, his enemies will see the undersole of Jesus' feet. Second thing is to take a fresh look at the Psalms. I alluded to this earlier. Start reading your Psalms. Start reading your Bible. Realizing that this is a book about a future king, a future Jesus. It foreshadows Jesus. And begin, instead of skimming the psalm, study it. Study it intently, circumspectly. Line by line, study the neighbors, and it'll be an incredible exercise for you to learn to hear the voice of God, even in the Psalms. After all, Jesus turned there. And after all, every New Testament writer turns to the Psalms for support and evidence of your claim of Jesus. Can't we do that? Yes. Uh, that's not what people are taught, by the way, in seminary. I wasn't taught that in seminary. I was taught the old erroneous way that the Psalms are just a jumbled collection of this Psalm and that Psalm. Totally incorrect. Missing the evidence. Study the Psalms. They're pregnant with Jesus. Sorry for the metaphor, but I don't know how else to say it. And then third and lastly, be encouraged by the intercessory work of Jesus who is at the Father's right hand, and yes, he's waiting. But I read these words for you as a source of encouragement. Who is going to convict us? It is Christ Jesus who died, even more who was raised, and who is also at God's right hand. It is Christ Jesus who pleads our case, who will separate us from the love of Christ. Will we be separated by trouble, distress, harassment, famine, nakedness? Danger, sword, as it is written, we are being put to death all day long for your sake. We are treated like sheep for slaughter. But in all these things, we will win a sweeping victory through the one who loved us. 
I'm persuaded that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not death, not life, no angels, no rulers, no present things, no future things, no powers, no height or depth, or any other thing that is created. And finally, though I don't think it's recorded for us on the outline this morning, how then can you teach this passage to your kids? How do you explain this passage to your kids? How an infant Jesus, a baby Jesus, can be a big God. How do you do that? What would you do to explain this to your kids? What vision, image, analogy, skill? I would suggest, and this is just, this is not inspired. Certainly it's not gospel. It's just a tool. Sitting down at the table when you're during the Christmas season, get out a sheet of paper, a whiteboard, a chalkboard, something you can draw on, some sort of a big picture. Draw a timeline. Put David, 1,000 years BC. Of course, a little child may not understand time. I get that. It's abstract. But at least do the timeline. And then put your grandparents on there, great grandparents. Here's, here's grandpa so and so, and great grandpa so and so, and show them a picture of it. And then way back there is David. And David has this conversation with the Messiah. David had to, records a conversation between God, Yahweh, and Adonai, the Messiah. And then come down here to you. And somewhere in between, you've got the birth of Jesus. So uh, you've got that conversation with David. And then you've got Bethlehem over here. Jesus is a baby. And then there's you. And then there's grandparents over here somewhere. So take that board and point out where each of them is on the line and say, here's Jesus in heaven long before he was a baby. He was very alive. He was told by his father, God, that he has enemies, but those enemies one day be defeated. And then show that there's a birth, a little tiny baby, perhaps a picture. Perhaps a picture will help bring a huge abstract concept into some sort of reality for them. It's not the only tool. But right now is the time to start building your tools. So grab yourself a little notebook. And in here put tools. Tools to answer the questions of my kids or of my class. And here's a passage that will help me explain this concept. So make your dinner table, dinner table of theology. Make your supper table uh, a Bible institute. Uh, fun things, creative things. Let them walk away nourished not only in their tummy, but in their heart and soul. Consider that during, especially the Christmas season. If there's a better way to do it, do it. My idea is not inspired. Uh, but pick some sort of an idea to help them understand a, a, an important concept, incarnation. What's more important to Christianity than Jesus Christ is our divine Lord and our fellow human? So I hope this has sparked some thoughts. Maybe it'll go beyond this to a better idea. And if by all means, take that other idea and it's an improvement on the one I gave. Mine's half-baked and, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, needing to be improved, which I will readily admit. So there you have it. You have Jesus methodology asking questions and giving no answers. You might cost the same. You might consider the same. <laughs> Ask your kid questions. That's the way you used to do it in grad school. The professor would force you to stand up and answer questions. And man, if you weren't prepared, you were so embarrassed. So thanks for listening this morning. God arm you, equip you, and encourage you with this good news of Jesus. Let's stand and let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, normally at Christmas time we celebrate, and there's good cause for celebration. But we don't not want to avoid or miss an opportunity to teach. So while the bells are ringing and the songs are being sung, let us use the ops, the opportunities that come our way as teachers parents as teachers.
to communicate big thoughts to little hearts and big thoughts and big ideas to little minds to help them to begin to understand this incredible concept called incarnation. It's hard. It's hard for us. And so encourage moms and dads here to use the ops that come their way during the season. So when they look back, there's more than presents under the tree. When they look back, there's more than parties, more than food. There's kids and parents who've come together, they've talked, they've discussed, they've had good conversation, and they've grappled with big ideas that arm and prepare them for their life's journey as faithful followers of Jesus Christ. We ask in his name. Get out. Uh, our time is up here in this place. We're grateful that uh, Jesse and Faith do a great job of preparing this place for us. Thank you to them. This, this uh, blessing is taken from the last book written by John called The Apocalypse, literally, of Jesus. Chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. I'll begin. Please, you follow along. And now to Jesus, who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood, and has made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To Jesus be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Let us go forth to serve God and Amen. Thanks be to God. Thank you.